Hey everyone, um, moving right on to the legendary Eve Mader. Please tell us about living so many different exciting histories. I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for including me. Um, a nice old lady with so many wonderful young people. So um, it's hard to know exactly what to focus on, but I just wanted to make a few points about choosing a scientific problem because I think it's something we've all faced. But before I start, I just want to acknowledge all the wonderful people who've gone through my lab. And I'm showing you this because my lab includes people who've gone on to industry and government and to being academic scientists, as well as doing all different kinds of things. And I'm really proud of all of them. And so whatever people decide to do, um, I think is, is great. The other thing I'd like to say is that um, over the many years I've had a lab, I would say that almost everything interesting and important we've done was because one of these people had a good idea or did an experiment without telling me and then showed me something really, really interesting. So I think my intelligence as a PI was, was just recognizing when someone in my lab had done something wonderful. But to go back to the beginning, in 1956, um, I was born in 1948, so I was eight years old. And um, I was very confused because my parents had told me that you um, fell in love and got married when you found the one single magic person who was special in your life. And I looked out around me and everybody was married. I saw all these married people, but I couldn't figure out how they had found the one special person because I had a very good sense of the world was being very large. And the problem, I just thought it was impossible that finding the right person just by probabilities that my right person was probably gonna be in China on the other side of the world and I would never meet them. So I was dealing with the statistics of all of that. And I mentioned this to my father and he looked at me and he said, don't worry about getting married, get your PhD first. And I found this very comforting. I said, okay, fine. And I, that was the end of that, that thought. And so I, I, my father of course claims he never said this, but he did. Now, um, what I think was so interesting about that is he recognized um, how to take off an anxiety about something which was very much part of being a, a kid in the 1950s. So I entered in college in um, 1965 because, and I had always been very good in science, but I was very good in everything we did in school. And I was intended, intending to be a civil rights lawyer because I had a lot of friends who were very involved in the, in the nascent civil rights movement at the time. And it just seemed like, as an activist, that was the right thing to do. And I managed it for about two years, um, intending that. And then circumstances, and it's a long story, drove me back to biology. Um, but in my junior year, um, which was 1967, there was a random comment by a professor in an abnormal psychology class about schizophrenia, made me write a paper about inhibition in the brain, and I decided I was gonna be a neuroscientist. Um, and it's very interesting. I was in that class because a roommate of mine said, you have to take this class. So like all other college students, I did things according to what my roommates and friends were doing. And I think it's very interesting to know how important serendipity is in the way we make decisions and encounter new things. So in 1969, I entered the PhD program at UCSD. That year, there were 13 women in a class of 30, which caused great um, anxiety in everybody because they had never had a class of more than two women in a class of 30. And what happened is this was the year, 1968, was when the draft laws changed. And so until that point, being a graduate student, let, let a guy be draft deferrable, but the, then they were no longer draft deferrable. So they went to medical school or they went to Canada or they got whatever. Anyway, they made room for women to enter um, graduate school. So in the, in the two years between 1969 and 1971, basically all the life sciences programs in the US became more or less gender neutral. And so this is a really interesting thing to know that the Vietnam War is what changed the access of women to science. So today I am a neuroscientist and I did get married, but after my PhD, and um, <laughs> it was a number of years after my PhD, but I have a wonderful saintly husband um, who also is a neuroscientist. So picking a scientific problem. 
Um, one of the things I thought very deeply about in graduate school was I watched some friends who were working on what I would call a consensus problem. This is a problem that everybody in the field seems to agree is important. And I thought it would be really exciting to be working on a consensus problem because everybody would care about what you did. And then I realized that I wanted to do something where my particular contributions would make a difference. And that if you're working on a consensus problem, well, if I wasn't there, somebody else would be, and the problem would get solved, and I could just wait a year and read the paper. So I started thinking, and I realized there's a, a real challenge we all face, which is how to do something which is really interesting and new and novel and different, but something that people care about. And then there's the question of what do you do to make people care about something, which is your internal vision. And so it's a very interesting challenge because you can take yourself and put yourself in a hole and do something that nobody will ever care about. And if you work on a, a niche problem, you have to do a lot of background work to even get it to the, the right point where you can make the contribution. On the other hand, I just didn't want to be a cog in a giant machine. And so I've always um, managed to sort of keep a balance on this problem. But I think I'd just like to say one, one thing to any young people who are deciding about science, and that is basically you should always follow your heart. Science is just really too hard to do unless you're really excited about what you're doing. And doing it because somebody else tells you what you should be excited just doesn't work. You have to really care. And, and otherwise it's just too hard. Science is intrinsically hard, but that just makes it even harder. Okay, now my next insight, which I'd like to share with you is something that arose when I was a graduate student. Um, it was at the very, very beginning of neuroscience, molecular neuroscience. And we had a seminar at UCSD from a, one of the first people to actually measure RNA and neurons. And I went to the seminar and I, I was blown away and I walked out with a man named Peter Gottesheck and he was a phage lambda molecular biologist. And I said, Peter, wasn't that fabulous? He said, yes, it was fabulous. I said, do you want to do that? And he said, oh, no. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because I couldn't tolerate that much ambiguity. And he said, I work on lambda because that's the, um, the largest amount of ambiguity I can tolerate. And what I realized from having that conversation with him and watching people in the years to come is that in neuroscience, in many fields, the drive to understand the human brain or other really big picture pulls one up towards systems neuroscience or cognitive neuroscience or the moral equivalent in other fields. And then pushing the other way is every scientist's limited tolerance of ambiguity. And so it's almost like a sucrose gradient. You have to figure out if you're gonna be happy in the problem you solve or you work on, you have to find your own um, level of ambiguity that you can tolerate. So I've worked on small circuits my entire career, and that's because I could never tolerate the amount of ambiguity that people have when you work on large circuits. I just couldn't think about that number of things going on. On the other hand, my colleague upstairs for many, many years was Chris Miller, and he was an ion channel biophysicist. And he used to say to me all the time, Neurons are messy bags of perfectly good ion channels, basically saying that he couldn't tolerate the amount of ambiguity that I tolerated all, all much. And of course, my husband is a cognitive neuroscientist who works on humans and he works on language. And he says, well, yeah, there's a lot of ambiguity, but if you really care about language, you have to work with humans. So I think that is the biggest challenge that young people have and that we all have, which is to figure out how to work really happily and well with the level of ambiguity that we have. Okay, now I'd just like to make a couple more mistakes, a couple more statements. And that is one should always make your own mistakes. I made a couple of mistakes when I was a postdoc that weren't actually my mistakes. I did things because other people were pushing me to do them and I knew it was wrong. And that was the least good work I've ever done in my career was the work that I did because other people told me the right way to do it. And I, I did that. And it leads to disillusionment and to being bitter and twisted. If you make your own mistakes, you can forgive yourself and go past it. But if you find yourself making other people's mistakes, it's really very, very dispiriting. So um, you make that. And that's all about the trap of trying to please them. This goes back to selecting the problem 
because there's a them in the sky, which is always asking more of you than you can conceivably do. And their, their demands are infinite. So this goes back to you just have to basically satisfy yourself and your own um, and your own desire to do whatever you're doing. Now, I'd just like to tell you a couple more um, secrets or I was a postdoc and I was standing with Eric Kandel, who many of you know who that was, he, here he is. He was, um, he, he got the Nobel prize and he was at the time a very influential invertebrate neuroscientist. And we were at a poster session and a number, with a number of people then everybody wandered off, left him and me together. And some guy walked by and this was someone who had done a very nice PhD and then had sort of basically um, not done very much afterwards. And Eric looked at me and he said, do you want to know the secret of success? And I said, of course, right? And he looked around to make sure that nobody heard this, right? It was a secret. And he said, the secret of success is just to keep working. And I think that's deeply, deeply, deeply profound because when you keep working, you inevitably find a piece of gold. And if you stop working or if you talk yourself out of working or you convince yourself that an experiment isn't worth doing because it isn't worth doing, then you won't make discoveries. But if you just keep going, you will, and, and keep your eyes open and your ears open, you will stumble on something really quite wonderful. Now, one last comment, and that is every important finding in my career came from being stuck. Um, because when you're stuck, you have to turn the problem around and the solution will eventually scare you in the face, but it's when you're stuck is then when you, that's when you reach the boundaries of what's known. And that's where you make the real important um, new findings when you go beyond the boundaries of what's known. And um, I think I just lost, I don't know, lost my, my last slide, but it doesn't, it's not very important. Um, I think my last slide was just about um, multitasking, that is trying to do multiple things at the same time. It's, it's a way of buffering yourself against disappointment, but it also is a, has dangers that come with the possibility of flight, flightiness and not doing anything seriously. So I'm gonna stop there. And I just say, you know, everybody needs to find their own path and be willing to be a leader because the most important thing you need to do is to find your voice and be willing to go out front because that's where the new findings are beyond where knowledge ends. Thank you so much, Eve. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. This is all music to our ears. Um, um, I'm hard pressed to choose one question to ask, but uh, let me give it a try. Um, you, uh, you urged us to keep this integral piece of ourselves intact and to not be cogs in the wheel and to uh, follow our passions, which are all immensely appealing. Um, I wonder if you would unpack a couple of pitfalls and challenges in this context. And the, the big pitfall is that when you work in a big group on a consensus problem, you have a built-in support structure and there is a community that's gonna care about what you do. So there's a comfort in that community. And if you really wanna strike out on your own, you basically may have to forego the comfort of that community, um, or you may have to create a new community. So I think the extent, you know, I think a lot of postdocs in today's world, a lot of graduate students of postdocs today are very worried about getting enough support. And I think see that as a double-edged sword because it's wonderful to have support of your peers. But on the other hand, um, if you really want to, you know, work at the frontier of knowledge, then you have to be willing to go forward on your own. So it's it's a very complicated thing, which where everybody has to find their own compromise between having a community where there's agreement about what's important and being able to forge your own path. And no two people are gonna find that balance in the same way, but it's, it's a real tension. Uh, wow, on that very inspiring note of being a pioneer in seeding communities, thank you so much again, Eve. 
um, closing the recording in the interest of 